Today's episode of Kotlin Standard Library Safari is all about lists. Lists are the most popular collection type for a good reason, and we'll find out why today. I'm Seb, your host, and you'll get all of that in just a second. But first, a small request. Our data shows that about 60% of you watching right now are not yet subscribed to the Kotlin YouTube channel, so if you do want to help us out, do consider adding yourself to the list of subscribers. Alright, I'll stop with that, let's roll the intro. All right, lists. We've all seen them before. They're collections of ordered elements where each element is accessible via an index. But before we can access anything, we actually need to figure out where to get a list from in the first place. If you're creating lists on your own, you're most likely using the list of function, which takes a variable number of arguments, and those become the elements of your list. We've seen this way of creating a list about a hundred times in this show alone. A little lesser known is the ability to create lists via the list constructor function. Here we pass two parameters, the size of the list and a function that creates each of the elements in our list. The function we pass gets the element index as its parameter, so we can use that to adjust the item content and fill our list that way. Of course, lists can come from other places as well. Types like collections, iterables, and others often feature a toList method. For example, in the case of a string like our word salad here, we get a list of its characters. If we quickly whip up a map of placements and the medal that competitors will receive and then call to list on that, we get a list of key value pairs. Sequences, ranges and progressions behave similarly. They materialize their values and put them in a list, just like this random sequence of numbers or the integer range from 0 to 10. One extra case worth mentioning is calling to list on something that already is a list. This will get us a brand new copy of that list. To demonstrate it, I'm creating a mutable list with a bunch of numbers. We'll talk about mutable lists in more detail in just a second, but then I call to list, which creates a new copy. Now, when we change something in the original list, we can see that the working copy we just created does not contain any of the changes applied afterwards. So finally, it's time to pull some items out of our lists again. The most basic way of doing so is using the get function together with an index. In my case, you can see me pull the hot dog out of the list of fast foods here. But if you ever type out .get manually, you'll see that IntelliJ IDEA already gives you the helpful hint to use a much more popular syntactic sugar for this, the indexed access operator, denoted by the brackets with an index. Nevertheless, since we now know that this function is actually called get, we can use our IDE to explore some additional flavors of this function. And two results come up immediately, get or else and get or null. These two can help us handle cases when we might be accessing an index that falls out of bounds for our list. So either a negative index or an index that's larger than the last index in our collection. As you can see, if I wanted to access an index 3 for a list of length 3, a regular access would cause an exception. In these cases, we can use get or null to short circuit our return value to null. Alternatively, we can use get or else to compute a default value to be used instead. That value is computed based on a lambda that we pass. As you can see, it also receives the index that was attempted to be accessed. These special functions are only necessary to work with indices that might fall out of bounds though. Nullability, for example, is handled the same way as you would in any other situation in Kotlin. We can tame our list of nullable numbers with the power of the Elvis operator, smart casts, and friends. So we know how to get one item out of our list now. For getting more than one item out, we of course have the same take and drop functions that we introduced in the collections overview episode. Do check that one out if you haven't seen it yet. But lists come with another way of surgically retrieving items from the collection, the slice function. When we give this function a bunch of indexes, it returns the elements at those places in our list. In this example, we're passing a list with index zero, two, and four and get those items from our list of letters. Instead of writing out all the indices by hand, we could also use int ranges or progressions to specify the indices. For example, we could request all items from zero through three, or we could specify a custom step size of two, or we could even pull out some items in reverse order if we create a progression that uses down to. Quite elegant, right? As you may suspect, this list of list features is not quite exhaustive. As always, there's some more to explore even on this subject, but let's put that on the back burner for a bit and move on to a special kind of list. Yep, that's right, it's time for mutable lists. What makes those so special? Well, you can mutate them. That of course doesn't mean that these lists will turn into zombies, but that you can change their content. If we consult an excerpt of the class hierarchy, we can actually see that mutable list specializes list, meaning everything we've learned about lists so far also works for their mutable counterpart, plus some extra functionality. 
And it's exactly that extra functionality that we're interested in right now. Once again, mutable lists are commonly created via the mutable list of function with a bunch of values as arguments. And wherever you were able to find a to list method as discussed previously, you'll probably also find a to mutable list. This also includes other lists and mutable lists, where once again you'll get a fresh copy when calling to mutable list. All right, let's move on to the core of the topic. The difference with mutable lists is the ability to change content. That starts with adding something to the collection. If you want to add an extra number to the end of our list one, two, three, we can do so via the add function or by using the plus equals operator shorthand, both of which append an item to the end of the list. If we know where in the collection we want our item to go, the add function also accepts an index, which puts the new element at that position and moves the surrounding elements to accommodate it. In the same way, we can also add a whole other collection to our mutable list. We're of course not constrained to just adding elements to our list, we can also remove them. If you know what element we want to get rid of, we can do that via the remove function or the minus equals operator shorthand, which removes from our collection a single instance of the element we provide. In this example, after calling minus equals and remove, we got rid of two of the threes in our original collection because each invocation removed one of them. Alternatively, we can also pass the minus equals operator a collection of elements. In this case, the operator acts as a shorthand for the remove all function. Here, it looks at every element in the collection we pass and removes all instances of them in our original mutable collection. So, by passing one and four as a collection, we remove all instances of those numbers from our mutable list and we're left with only two and three at the end. If we know the index where we want to kick an item out, we use the remove add function instead. For example, we could remove the second element in our list, which resides at index one. To update an item, we most commonly use the indexed access operator, so the brackets together with an assignment. That one calls the set function with that index and specified element under the hood and switches out the item at the specified index. In this case, that will be trading a B for an A. In certain situations, we might want to turn all elements of our list into the same element, like zeroing out a buffer before reusing it. This is something we can do using the fill function, which replaces each element with the same value we specify. If we look at our list of fruits and suddenly realize that all of them really are just sugar, we can use fill to replace them with candy. All right, that metaphor may have been not entirely scientifically accurate, but you know, tasty nonetheless. And when we want to wipe our collection clean, the clear function can help us remove all elements from our collection. In our case, getting rid of all the candy. I wonder where it went. Perhaps unsurprisingly, mutable lists grow and shrink automatically to accommodate all your items, so you can have an arbitrary number of elements in your collection. This might be obvious, but it's so darn convenient I figured I'd mention it. Oh, the things we take for granted. Now, thinking back to some of the previous episodes, we've seen a bunch of neat functions which we probably wouldn't want to miss for mutable collections either. Things like sorted, shuffled, or reversed, which in their regular form don't modify the original collection. Well, I've got great news for all of us. These functions also have a mutable counterpart, always without the ed suffix. So when we want to sort, shuffle, or reverse a mutable list in place, instead of creating a new separate copy with the effects applied, we use the sort instead of sorted, shuffle instead of shuffled, and reverse instead of reversed function. Mutable lists also offer the possibility to remove or keep all elements that fulfill a certain predicate. The remove all function can remove all elements that match the predicate we specify. Let's say we're not a fan of small numbers in our collection and only want to keep numbers that are five or above. Remove all helps us do exactly that. The retain all function is the opposite and only keeps those elements in the mutable list that match. If we want to retain every character in our collection that is a letter, we do that with the retain all function. This might feel a bit familiar to you, and rightfully so, because these are essentially the mutating equivalents of the filter and filter not functions. The last topic on today's agenda is views on lists. That name already hints at what they allow us to do. They allow us to look at the elements in our list from a bit of a different perspective. Let's see what that actually means. Let's assume we have a collection of fruits. To create a view, we can use the sublist function, which takes a beginning and end index. That determines which elements should be visible in our view. And having a look at this sublist, we can see that it indeed contains the elements from our original collection from index one to index four exclusive. Because this is only a view, 
and not a copy of our original collection, changes are automatically visible. If we change the orange to a banana in the underlying fruits list, then our sublist will reflect that as well. And the real kicker is that this sublist is actually in itself mutable as well. If we change the green apple in our sublist to a pineapple and have a look at our original fruits collection again, we see that the change is visible from here as well. Or we can use the fill function, which we've learned about earlier, to turn an interval inside of our fruit list back into candy again. Again, all of that works because these aren't two different collections. There's only one collection and the sublist has merely given us a different perspective on that list. There's one important thing to note about sublists though. They are only well defined as long as the underlying original list is not structurally changed. That means that changes affecting the size of the list, for example, automatically mean that any views previously returned by invoking sublist have undefined behavior. That's just something to keep in mind. For a common case, which is looking at a list backwards, the Kotlin standard library also comes with the as reversed function. It provides a backwards view of the underlying list. Once again, changes made in the view are visible in the original collection and vice versa. That means turning the orange into a banana also changes what we see in the reversed view and altering it back to a pineapple via our reversed view also alters our original collection. These types of views are actually available for non-mutable lists as well and allow you to pass around different sub-selections of your lists without having to create new copies every time. But I figured using their mutable variant really drives the point home that there really is only one underlying collection. And with that, we've reached the end of today's episode. I hope that some of the stuff you've seen today has helped you strengthen your understanding of Kotlin lists. When you're back at it writing Kotlin code, see if you can apply some of the stuff we've talked about today. Whether it's slicing a collection using sublists or handling out of bounds situations for lists elegantly with the get or null and get or else functions. If you've learned something new and want to see more like this, make sure to give this video a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell. In the next episode, we are going to talk about Kotlin sets and I'm sure you don't want to miss that one. But regardless, it's time for all of you to go and explore some more Kotlin. Take care and see you in the next one.